It's great to be here with Jesse Marsh, Red Bull Salzburg Bonnet Hi, Jesse. Hey, Donald. How are you, buddy? Very well. It's been a few years since I've seen you, I think. Yeah, yeah. But we've managed to keep in touch over the time, and, yeah. and I've kept track of you, and so it's it's nice for you to have me. Uh, yeah, I'm really happy. I'm delighted. I'm delighted. And could you just, uh, I suppose, start the interview, Jesse, could you tell us just a little bit on your journey to Salzburg then, yeah. especially in the coaching you know, side of things? Yeah. So, you know, after I played 14 years in MLS and, and I was always in the U.S., um, then I had a, a couple different coaching jobs in, in MLS as well. I, I was an assistant uh, with the U.S. national team, the 2010 World Cup. But my last job that I had in MLS was with the New York Red Bulls. Yeah. And one of the beauties was that I had this access to the other clubs that are part of the Red Bull family here. So, you know, I would take trips to Leipzig and to Salzburg in the off season, and I would meet the coaches, meet the sport directors, see the scouting setup, see the academy setup. And we tried to implement a lot of the things that they've done so successfully, specifically here at Salzburg at, into what we were doing in New York. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was really fun to be, to be part of a bigger global network and have access to, to, to things that were outside of our realm of possibility. So um, we benefited greatly from that in New York and certainly I did too. And yeah, after a couple of years, they started talking to me about potentially coming over to Europe and, and working with, with some of the teams over here. And I, and I know the track record for American coaches hasn't always been so great. So I was excited on one level, but, but also knew that, that, you know, I would have to go about it the right way. That led me to learning more German. And I started taking German uh, in the U.S. in my last two years there when I worked with New York. And then it also then uh, provided me with the opportunity to go to Leipzig as an assistant first. And I, and I really felt strongly that that was the right decision to give me a little bit more experience, to get me ingrained in the culture of European football. Um, and then that set me up, I think, ultimately the idea was for me at some point to come here to Salzburg and, and, and be the head coach. So I think the process and the relationships and the, the progression of the way that things have gone have set me up for success here. And, and we've, we've really enjoyed a, a great year and a half here in, in Salzburg together. Brilliant. When you look then, JC, at the, the the whole Red Bull network and, and how you accessed it, having played, you know, in the US and played kind of so successfully and almost in a traditional field, was it very different to then kind of go out into a network of clubs or, a, you know, than to what you were used to? Or did it feel just quite natural? Well, I, I had done it a lot. So when I was a player, um, I had a bunch of teammates that were either from Europe or had gone mm. after I played with them and had gone to Europe. Mm. And I often in the off season in December and in January would, would come to Europe and I would visit clubs. I would watch training. I would watch games. And I was always very intrigued by how the game works over here. Mm. So I had some access to, to certain things, but certainly when I became part of the Red Bull family, I really got the inside track on, everything from the training methods to, to what the physical workloads are like, to what the tactics and the video analysts and the science behind a lot of things and how things are structured with academies. And I think that the depth at which I, I had access to things really helped me think about how I could put them into application in New York. Um, and, and, you know, I learned a ton. The, the, the main guy that kind of created the infrastructure of this whole Red Bull system is Ralph Rangnick. Yeah. And he was sort of a mentor for me from the, from the beginning uh, in New York. And, you know, he's a really brilliant guy. And he, he, he thinks about football in a very uh, detailed manner. And it forced me and it opened my eyes to the yeah. fact that there was so much more to, to layering how we could think, how we could talk, how we could operate in terms of trying to apply style of play. So it, it was a lot of fun, you know. Yeah, it, it sounds it. I, I, I described my first years in New York often as like wearing a lab coat and working with the training loads and then working with the tactics and trying to implement a lot of the ideas. But in, in my own way, that was true to me and true to our player pool and the league that we operated in. So we had some great success. And I certainly I learned a lot from all the German people that we worked with in terms of like implementing a, a more detailed model of how things work. 
And how did you find then, if we we'll almost quite quickly go on to your leadership or your training or your football philosophy, how did you find players reacted or took on the changes you were implementing? So, you know, one of the funny things with New York in general is when they first inter interviewed me for the job, I said, I don't think I'm the right guy because at the time they had Thierry Henry, they had an old young coach and it was all about the superstar. And I told them, I was like, I, I don't think I'm the right guy for this job. I, I believe in the team concept. I believe in everyone working together and, and the team mentality. And later on, they told me that's exactly why we hired you because we found this <laughs> name and we needed to, to, even when I've spoken to different people at different times, they asked me how to do interviews. I was like, I don't know the interview I did the best. And I, I thought I said all the wrong things, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, um, you know, the players, I think were also hungry in the club yeah. when we were in New York for things to change. I think they all liked Thierry and liked playing mm -hmm. with him, but they could also see that there were limitations to, to the potential of everybody's worth by just focusing on this one superstar. So when we when we really tried to, to engage everyone a little bit more and the academy and young players, they were hungry for that and, and, it, and it fit really well. So we, we, we enjoyed great success, but we also had a lot of fun. I think that was, and that's a big key for me is especially, you know, I'm coaching so many young players. It, it shouldn't feel like work. Of yeah. course we have to, when we get on the pitch, we have to really apply ourselves and do everything we can to get better. But there should be a real energy when you come to work every day, a feeling that, you know, that people want to be here. They want to yeah. spend time. They want to be part of this. I think if you can get that right, then you can breed success. What, what are some of the key elements do you think that you have to bring to a club to make it fun? It sounds an obvious question, but how do you make a professional environment fun every day for players? Yeah. I mean, first, um, you know, my energy is important. Yeah. Um, the way that I show up every day, smile on my face, mm -hmm. saying hello to everybody, yeah. making checking in with guys, you know, really making everybody know that I care about them, not yeah. just that I'm here to be their boss or, yeah. you know, or their coach, but to actually show um, that I care about them. Yeah. I, I like to learn their wives, their girlfriends' names. When their families come, I always let them know that their families are welcome. We, we make our meals open to, to friends and family and girlfriends and everything. So the energy of the building itself needs right. to be right. And so much of that comes from me. Yeah. And then, you know, when we do video, when we, when we're on the pitch and training, when, when, um, you know, we're, we're in the gym doing our workouts there in the, in the meal room, there's always this, we always have to have a, a direction in terms of where we're trying to go and what we're trying to achieve and, and how to work together. But like, we have to also, you have to have a smile on your face. You have to be willing to laugh. You have to laugh at yourself. You have to, you know, I really think that you have to uh, make it so that um, it's not just work. I mean, this is an incredible line of work that we're yeah. part of. It's not just work. It's enjoyment. It's expression. It's, it's everybody really trying to be the best version of themselves. And so, you know, but again, a lot of that does have to come from me and my energy with everything I do. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I was laughing when you were saying it because it reminds me it's so different, almost certainly how I was brought up in terms of learning anything, isn't it? You just listen, whatever you do, don't say anything back. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I had played for some coaches growing up where I felt like, they were always watching me, but like kind of like judging me or seeing yeah. if I was doing something wrong or waiting to correct me. And, and I, you know, I, I'm very observant and, and I, but it's more to check in and see that guys are doing okay. And that, that they have the positive energy that they're giving to the group. Like a big phrase I use is the more you give, the more you get. So, you know, I mean, I, I want that kind of energy around the locker room. And certainly I don't, when I walk around, the last thing I want them to do is when they see me kind of look out the corner of their eye and wonder what I'm thinking, or am I overlooking them? Or because that's, I think that doesn't breed um, the ability to go for things, to be aggressive, to give the best of yourself. So that's, that's really important. You know what I mean? And, and it's a different, I work with young players a lot. And it's also like, we have to understand there's newer generations of people coming through and, and a lot of them respond a lot better to positive 
feedback than they do negative. There's always negative feedback in, in our world. There has to be, but it always has to be shaped with a way of, of an idea for improvement and, 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 and for getting better. Yeah. I love, I love that. Too. So, you know, a lot of the, you know, the work <clears throat> doing coach education or throughout businesses is in that whole area of emotional intelligence and, you know, how important it is, as you were saying about working with young players, you know, to be able to know yourself and slightly change or adapt to get the most out of the people in front of you. How important do you think emotional intelligence now is to a modern coach? Well, that, they, that's a word they use in German. So the first time I heard the word emotional intelligence was in German, in Germany. And I kind of laughed because, you know, Germans are very structured yeah. and they're not so uh, uh, emotionally intelligent. So when they see someone emotionally intelligent, they wanted to label it because that's also German. Yeah. <laughs> and I and I said, my response was they're like, they because they would say to me, you're very emotional intelligent. And I would say, you mean normal. <laughs> that's what it is it's really yeah. it's not, you know i mean it's it's about your ability to have relationships your ability to observe your ability to listen um and and then you know how you can create the type of environment where people where that becomes contagious and people want to operate like that and and i think the more that you again the more you do that then the more you get givers and not takers yeah. If you look back at, at yourself as a player, you know, and, and your journey to as you, where you are as a coach now, do you think you've changed? You've changed a lot as a person, or has it just evolved? You know, naturally to who you are. Yeah, I mean, f f first, I really think. So I talk a lot about development. I talk yeah. about operating out of the comfort zone. I talk a lot about vulnerability. Um, and I, I feel like it's our job in life as human beings mm -hmm. to, to develop, to get better, to learn, to grow. Mm -hmm. um, as a player, I knew I wanted to be a coach. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but as a player, and I had friends who were coaches at the time in, 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 in football and in other sports. Mm -hmm. um, and, but their minds were more wrapped because they weren't players at the time. They had, they had their minds more wrapped around just being mm -hmm. a coach. And that was their passion. And at the time I was a player, my passion was almost entirely winning. <laughs> that was all I cared about, right? And, and, and I felt like that's all that mattered. And then as I became a coach, I, at first when I was at first an assistant coach and then I was working more and more in coaching, I, I thought that that was still going to be a, a, a major tenant in my philosophy of the way that I did things. But then the more that I started to put into practice the kind of coach that I wanted to be, I, I, I realized that Focusing on on the results was an uh, uh, was the antithesis of what yeah. I was trying to create. Yeah. So I I started to think more about how I could develop a process and then relationships and what what it was that the work was going to be more important than the results and actually trying to remove the results from the daily work was more important than actually focusing on winning itself. Yeah. And I feel like if we get the process right and if we get the work right that the byproduct often is winning right yeah. certainly you have to have enough talent and you have to be equipped with the with the tools to to be successful but that part i think if i now you know maybe it's uh 12 years 11 no wait it's uh, yeah it's like 11 years since i stopped playing i think if the player me looked at the coach me he would be wondering what the hell are you doing? <laughs> yeah, winning, winning. Yeah. Let's focus but, on the process. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but truly, I mean, especially again, working with young players, it, it, you have to, you have to leave them freedom to fail. You have to, you have to give them freedom to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. But I, I talk a lot about the making the right kinds of mistakes, mm -hmm. right? The mistakes that are true to the things that we're trying to achieve. And if we do that effectively, then then we're gonna then the learning process is in place so yeah i mean that's an interesting one donald i you know i mean is it is it what is it is it going from player to coach is it growing older and 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 molding your leadership in different ways i don't know i mean maybe it's a little bit of both but but i'm i'm certainly a lot happier with who i am as a leader now than what i was 12 years ago yeah, that's. I think it's really interesting because what you've described in the short time we've been speaking, isn't it? It's 
it's very difficult for a lot of people, A, to move from player to coach because you're starting to describe things you're doing unconsciously. But also what you're describing is you've executed very high levels of detail with high connection as well, isn't it? And that feeling. And a lot of people can either do one or the other, you know, be really detail oriented or be a great people person. And you seem to be have been able to pull together a philosophy that works for you as a person and, and also transfer it to a team and helping people to develop and actually, you know, being able to take other people with you up and down an organization, which I think is pretty special. Yeah, I mean, listen, in the end, I'm, I am a football coach, mm. you know, so I have to, I, I describe it often as you have to have a plan, right? When you, you have to have a way of playing, you have to have a way of training, you have to have um, an idea of, of strategically what you're trying to do on the pitch, and you have to have a way of executing that plan in your training every day and, and, and in your game, certainly. But the plan for me, it, it allows me to do the things that I'm passionate about, which are the relationships and the leadership and the communication and the, and the finding a way to get the best of everyone. Um, and I think they have to work together. It's like building a house and a foundation and you kind of build it brick by brick. But certainly once, I, once the plan is, is put in place and it's, and it's being executed, we're always trying to fine tune the plan mm -hmm. to see how good can we be at the details and the tactical nuances and, and how flexible and how intelligent can we make our players on the pitch. Mm -hmm. But once that's in place, then it's about, you know, when they have the plan, how much can they inject their personality and their belief system and their, their mentality? The, the, the people in Austria here, they make fun of me a lot because I use the word mentality and it's, in German, it's mentalität. So it's <laughs> easy enough to translate. So I say it a lot, but they, they, they almost make fun of me. And, but I say to them, listen, once you know what the plan is, the mentality is everything. Yeah. And their ability to throw themselves at the plan with, fearlessness and to go after it and be as aggressive as they possibly can allows them to succeed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's not that I don't like the, I love the football parts, you yeah. know, I love training every yeah. day. I love try, but, but it's the, it's the, it's the seeing people succeed and dig down deep in themselves and bring out the best. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah, I really love. And, you know, if I, I come back to what you said about, you know, there's a lot that's was written about vulnerability and leadership just now. And, and if we can think about how does a player or a coach make themselves vulnerable? And if I come back to your interview in New York, that's a, just a great example. And we speak in servant leadership when the business work we do is sometimes when you think you're looking bad, you're looking good. And when you think you're looking good, you're looking bad. And it's such a great example of when you were so honest about this is what I'm about and, and I want to do this, that turned into gold for you. And I suppose my question is, how would a player or a coach be vulnerable? How, how would they go about being that? Because I know it's a challenge, isn't it? For yeah. Me? Well, I mean, I'll start with myself. And, and one of the big ways is when I, I speak German with the team every day and, and I use it as an example to them. Like, and, and I tell them I don't speak German with them because I think my German is great. I say, I tell them it's the only way for me to improve is to put it to practice every day, make mistakes, learn from mistakes and apply it the next day in a way that makes me better at being able to speak. I've increased my uh, fluency here in German since I've been in Salzburg by a thousand percent probably because it's just, it, it, I, I force myself, it's an obsession to get better every day. Mm -hmm. And then, and what the funny thing is, is in the locker room, when I speak in front of the team, if I make a mistakes, a lot of times they'll correct me. They help me, right? They want, they yeah. want me to get better. They, 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 they feel attached to my German learning. Right. And, and so by doing, by seeing my vulnerability, they actually have gotten closer to me and they want to help me and it's created a stronger bond. Right. Not as a great example. And I, and I use it when, if we're, if at halftime and, and maybe we'll have changed the, or after a game, if we changed the, the tactical structure, if we did something and I'm not happy with, with the plan we put in place or a sub we made or something we did, I'll always say to the team, listen, I wasn't happy with myself that I didn't do this and I didn't do that. 
and we could have done this better, but also guys, what about this? And what about that? We need to figure out how to keep, keep getting better. They, they, they look at that as not, oh, he's weaker because he made mistakes. They look at it as he's human, just like we are. We have to have a, an environment where making mistakes is normal. It's a normal part of getting better. When I talk with the players, they're used to coming in my office and, and shutting the door. And I always have the door open. I, I, I have most of the conversations with players individually in the locker room or off on, or out on the pitch. I try to make it as informal as possible and just a normal part of the way that we exist with each other. And that learning and video and everything, this is all part of getting better. So they, they understand it partly because I show it and, but more so because of the way that I apply it to, to who we are every day. Superior and, example. Yeah, this is, this is, this is comfort zones. I, I say to them often, because a lot of times you get young guys that come here and they don't want to say much. They don't want to embarrass themselves mm -hmm. on the pitch. They try, they try not to make mistakes. They're, they're respectful of the veterans that they're playing with or against. Comfort zones are the worst things for people. <laughs> see when you stand up and see the germ and you know when you're giving the example of learning the german within your body do you feel the vulnerability that of you opening yourself up to the guys especially at the beginning yeah yeah i mean listen i always it's important that i still am able to come up with solutions yeah. and read them and talk to them and inspire them in the right way but i, I like not being perfect is good yeah it's, it's human it's it's and and they need to know that it's the same for them as it is for and for me as it is for all of us mm -hmm. so yeah i mean vulnerable i mean i even have reading articles uh, that i give the team sometimes about different things and vulnerability is a big one mm -hmm. um and and I, I want them to to know in the same way that i said that i don't walk around the training center and stare and judge everyone mm -hmm. We all, we need to be ourselves, but we need to also think about who we are and how we can grow. And again, what's the best version of ourselves and how to get to that. Brilliant, that, that's inspiring. Just to finish with, if you had any, I suppose, any guidance for a young coach coming into the game just now to, to do what exactly what you said, you know, be themselves while learning and developing, what would you say to them? It's not an easy thing to do, yeah. okay? Because I, when I had my first job with the Montreal Impact, mm -hmm. after the, I left after the year. And after the year, I realized that I spent almost the entire year trying to be a man named Bob Bradley, who was my coach for much of my playing career. And he's an incredible leader and an incredible man. But we're very different person mm -hmm. with our personalities. And what I would say is it's important to have mentors and good mentors, right? We all need those examples in our life that kind of help paint a little bit of a blueprint for maybe the business that we're in or how things operate or how relationships should work. But in the end, again, if we're talking about improvement, if we're talking about the best version of ourselves, we have to, especially as leaders, get to the core of who we are. Because when you stand in front of a group, they can sniff out if it's fake, if it's rehearsed, if it's not authentic. And, and in the end, as a leader of people, you have to be very selfless in, in the way that you look around and, and see what people need and where they are in their own paths. But in there, you most importantly need to know exactly what are the things that are important to you and how to impart that on a group. And so that's not so easy. That comes mm -hmm. with experience, but I think a, a pursuit of your truth is really important. It's really important. I love that. I just posted, uh, it was a Carl Jung quote last night, and he said very similar to what you said. You know, it's, it, it's it, if you're looking in front of your path and it's a clear path, it's probably someone else's. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, brilliant, you know, we all yeah. have to yeah. find our own path. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So that's brilliant, Jesse. Thanks for taking the time to speak to me this morning. I know you're, you're full on and uh, it's great to catch up again. Yeah, you too, Donald. And, and I mean, I'd be willing to do this anytime again. Yeah. 
um, it's always nice to, to, you know, the first time we met was when you came to the Scottish FA course for the yeah. pro license and, and yours was one of my favorite talks that we had be, partly because you're good, <laughs> but also the, the things that you work with are things that, that, uh, really interest me. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm always trying to pick up little things that you're writing and, and little things that you're doing. So it's an honor to be here with you. And, and let's keep in touch, my man. Good evening, Jesse. Thanks okay. very much. Okay, Cheers. take care.